afternoon's uh, session. <clears throat> I'm Mike Ferguson. I'm the Dean of Research for the College of Life Sciences at the University of Dundee. So I have a very big interest in, in life sciences in general, particularly interested in the translation of basic science towards therapeutic uh, solutions, uh, particularly keen on this afternoon's uh, first uh, session here, Evolution of Non-Profit Organizations, and how we as a collective, academics, PDPs and industry can work together to, to solve unmet medical needs that, to, to help the planet. And we're going to hear some, two great examples uh, about that this afternoon. I should also say that the University of Dundee is, is, uh, is very excited to have Bio Dundee as one of its main uh, partners in, in, in the city. Bio Dundee is a great organization, and I'm sure you've been enjoying all the uh, organizational skills of, of, of Alison Beattie and her colleagues in, in, in getting the event uh, off to a great start. So. Uh, to, the first speaker this afternoon is, is Ken Duncan. Now, Ken is uh, a Scot and uh, was trained uh, in Edinburgh and then uh, did his PhD in Glasgow and postdoctoral work in Glasgow, as well as postdoctoral experiences at MIT in Boston and Harvard Medical School before joining GlaxoSmithKline, where he worked for, for many years and took on a, a tremendously important role there in, in, in the neglected diseases area and is a great expert in tuberculosis in particular. Since 2004, he's been at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where he's now the Deputy Director of Drug Discovery and Translation, with a special remit for neglected diseases, particularly TB, malaria, diarrheal diseases, and, and indeed other neglected tropical diseases. So uh, he's a very experienced coordinator of academic industrial PDP uh, sector cross-collaborations to deliver solutions for the developing world. And I'd like to invite him to come and give us his presentation entitled Partnerships in Drug Discovery and Development. Ken. Thank you, Mike, for that uh, introduction. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be back here in Scotland and, and uh, to talk to you today. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to, to give you the opportunity to speak and tell you a little bit about the foundation and the work that we do. So the, what I'm actually going to talk about today then is really to introduce the work of the foundation broadly, um, then talk to you about our drug discovery portfolio, which I'm responsible for, and then talk a lot about the importance of partnerships and how we work as an organization and some of the things that, that we do which are sometimes different from the traditional ways of, of working. Uh, I hope to touch on a number of things which actually came up this morning. There was a lot of interesting ideas that uh, came up during the, the presentations. And I think you'll see from what we do that we tend to try and work in a very collaborative and, and open way. So moving on then, let me tell you a little bit about the work of the foundation. The foundation um, is, is a private foundation. It's uh, headed by the co-chairs, Bill and Melinda Gates. Um, and their belief was, is very much that all lives have equal value. And that drives very much everything that we do. So um, that leads us to to work in very particular ways, and we obviously address things where there's the greatest inequality in the world. The history of the foundation is that back in the late 90s, um, Bill Gates was, was very, very busy with Microsoft, but was also um, starting to think about um, philanthropy in, in general. Bill and Melinda read an article about rotavirus back in, in 1998 and were astonished to, 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 to learn that half a million children a year die from this and vaccine preventable disease. And that really spurred their interest in starting to think about the bigger problems and to try and analyze where they could have the biggest impact. Um, back in 2000 was when the foundation as it currently stands finally came together. And during the early part of the 2000s, it started to expand its efforts. The foundation was boosted um, in 2006 by um, Warren Buffett, who decided to give away his wealth through the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And that really uh, doubled the size of, of the investments that are made annually. In 2008, um, Bill joined the, full, the foundation full time, and he's a very active participant, and he's very engaged in the work that we do. Um, in terms of the reach of the organization, we're based in Seattle, and we have a number of offices around the world, including one here in the UK in London. Um, there's about 1,100 employees who are, are responsible for the work that the foundation does. In 2012, we made grants of about $3.4 billion. Um, 
the since since inception, that's that's twenty six billion dollars spent, and and the endowment currently, as it stands, is about thirty four billion dollars. Yeah, sorry, thirty six billion dollars. We also have the funding from um, from Warren Buffett, which I mentioned. So over time, this will represent a significant investment um, in the areas for which we're responsible. The things that we actually focus on are really are driven by two simple questions. What are the areas of greatest need and, and where can we have the greatest impact? And that inevitably means focusing in on things like uh, vaccines in the developing world. That's where we can really have the most immediate impact. And you've probably heard news stories around polio eradication. It's our number one priority as a foundation at, at the moment. And really trying to drive the world towards a solution for that particular problem. So that's the, these are the, 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 really the way that we approach our work in terms of how we think about it. The actual programs that we work on, I, I sit in the Global Health Program, which makes up about 50% of what we do. Global development is, is um, I'm not going to talk about in detail. That's much more around access to, to medicines, diagnostics, vaccines, and also in a fairly big agriculture and livestock program. And then the other piece is the United States program, which is primarily about in, improving education in the United States. And uh, I'm not going to talk about that at all today either. In terms of the particular program areas, this is just a breakdown of, of um, the different areas and, and what was spent on them. This is actually 2011 uh, grants paid out. You can see there that the biggest single area was, was global health, nearly $2 billion of grants in, in 2011. Now, we actually use a number of different mechanisms when we're making investments. Grants has been the principal way that we've operated in the past and will continue to operate. We also do contracts for certain types of things. And more recently, we've started doing work with program-related investments. In other words, areas where and there's a programmatic need, and we've identified a program that makes sense for us, but it's with an organization that's a private organization, and it makes um, a, a much more productive strategic partnership if we actually make a program-related investment, an investment in the organization itself, and in the, in the long-term health and the direction of that organization. So there's a number of different tools, but primarily we're driven against the, the strategic priorities in the foundation. For global health, um, the, the most important thing is to think about this as, as an integrated approach. So there's no single solution in most of the areas that we work in. Very many cases, we need everything from diagnostics, drugs, vaccines, um, vector control. So if you think about a disease like malaria where we're driving towards eradication, no single tool is going to get you there. And you need to think about the balance of investments across these different areas and sometimes the staging and the timing of the investments to, to have the biggest impact. But all of the specific areas all start off with strategies, and these all seek to have some transformational change in the world. So something which is not just going to be an incremental improvement from where we are today, but something which is going to have the biggest impact on the, the, the populations that, that um, we're trying to address. All of our strategies, though, are, are not done in isolation. They're always done with partners. We don't actually do any work directly at the foundation in the sense of, you know, we don't have laboratories, we don't develop things. We, it's all done through partnerships, as, as I'll talk about a little bit in the, in, the, in, in the longer term. The other thing is that we work very closely with many other organizations, and we're very closely aligned with, with other organizations because as a foundation, although we have a very large endowment, it's a relatively small amount of money in the grand scheme of things. And so we work very closely with governments, with government agencies, and, and uh, many other partners to um, become aligned and to ensure that we're having the, the greatest impact. Many of our strategies do emphasize technology. And this, again, is driven by the co-chair's belief that um, the, the, the many uh, problems can be solved by technology. So in, in a lot of what we do, we tend to have that focus on, on new technologies that are going to solve problems. So let me just walk you through the drug discovery portfolio and tell you a little bit about the diseases that we've uh, worked on historically um, in our portfolio. It's not a great number of diseases. We really work on four major areas and a few others which we have smaller investments in for, for very strategic reasons. But these are the four major areas that we work on. 
malaria, um, the helminth diseases, TB, and diarrheal disease. Then I'm also going to talk about platforms. So when we think about the drug discovery portfolio, we have individual focused investments in each of these areas, but we we'll also invest in some platform technologies that really are to address across uh, all of those areas. Taking malaria first, you'll see in each of these slides I'm going to go through, there is a, a little map, which is really just to illustrate the, the burden of disease around the world and where it's focused. Our, our priorities in malaria have shifted to a certain extent from initial, an initial focus on drug discovery for agents um, which treat acute malaria. So this is malaria caused by Plasmodium falciparum, and this is what really kills very many children, especially in Africa. About 650,000 lives are lost every year to, to malaria. And so we have focused on a pipeline of drugs to treat acute malaria. And there is actually quite a healthy pipeline in place already. But as we start to think about the future, we're moving towards an eradication agenda. And what are the tools that we require for eradication? So, so the target product profile that we currently have is this thing that we call CERCAP, or Single Encounter Radical Cure and Prophylaxis. That's asking an awful lot, so it's not going to come out of a single pill. It will likely come from a combination of, of pills. But we need to intervene in the malaria life cycle in many different stages, going beyond the blood stage of the disease to the liver stage to, um, to the, the, long, the hypnozoic forms, which um, are particularly prevalent in plasmodium vivax infections and cause these recurrences of the disease, to the gametocytes and, and the, the stages which are the, the sexual stages which are involved in transmission. And so we're looking to interrupt, interrupt now at multiple different stages. In helminths, the two diseases we're particularly focused on are onchocerciasis, or river blindness, and lymphatic filariasis, or elephantiasis. And these are really chronic diseases that cause major problems in developing countries. Especially, again, looking at the map, you can see Africa is, is, is badly affected by these diseases. So these are diseases that affect about a billion people in the world. They're treated at the moment with um, <coughs> mass drug administration programs. So you've probably heard of ivermectin. It's a drug which Merck has given away for many years and will give away until river blindness has, has disappeared. <coughs> and the second one, elephantiasis, is, is uh, treated with albendazole, a drug which GlaxoSmithKline donates. And these are treated by just giving everybody one pill once a year, or there's various regimens to that. But, but that's the basic concept, is that what you're doing is you're interrupting transmission once a year. But you have to keep doing that for long periods of time. So in the case of onchocerciasis, the worms that cause the infection live for anything up to 17, 18 years. So you can imagine you have to give that treatment for very, very long periods of time. So what we are doing is now focusing in on <coughs> what we call a macrofilaricide, something which kills off the adult worms. And the idea then is that if you kill the adult worms quickly, then you don't need to keep giving that mass drug administration for years and years and years. And the second problem is that there's another co-infection which doesn't really cause disease. It's caused by, a, by another worm called Loa Loa. And in areas which are co-endemic for Loa Loa, you can't give these other treatments because it leads to severe adverse reactions. So we can get around that by, by killing off the adult worms. The third area is, is TB, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail in a minute. This is the one disease which is a global disease, even though the incidence in many countries like the UK is, is pretty low. Um, it, is, it is seen globally. Um, and the major focus here is to get to a much shorter treatment regimen. Now, you might also have heard of stories of multidrug-resistant TB or extensively drug-resistant TB, or more recently, this TDR-TB or totally drug-resistant TB. Those are really major problems, and it's something that we do care about. But the major focus that we have is on shortening the therapy because that's what will have an impact on, on the epidemic in the, in the longer term. And finally, our other priority is diarrheal disease. This is a major killer of, of under fives, or in particular under two-year-olds. Um, and at the moment, the way it's treated is with uh, oral rehydration salts, ORS. But the compliance with that is pretty poor. And the reason is that you have to treat, take this for seven days. And uh, you're giving a lot of liquids to a child which has diarrhea. So the obvious consequence is that the diarrhea gets worse even though the child is actually getting better. So the compliance is pretty poor. 
So our approach to this is, is not to try and tackle the pathogens themselves, because multiple different pathogens cause diarrhea, but rather we're looking at, at agents which treat the host and actually treat the human and prevent the water loss that's associated with diarrhea. So we're looking for anti-secretory agents here. So it's a very different approach from some of these other anti-infectives approaches. So that fairly broadly is, is an insight into the, the specific pathogens in the areas that we're, we're focusing on. I'd also just like to mention, though, some of the platform technologies. And this is an area where we actually have a lot of interaction with biotechs and, and with uh, organizations that are trying to build a platform, sometimes for one indication, but where that indication may have a use for global health. Um, we have um, investments with, uh, or we work in partnership with many um, pharma companies and, and other organizations that are high, high throughput screening, or the sorts of lead optimization technologies and the specialization that needs to happen there to really do things at, at proper scale in terms of, of the efforts that we make to, to find new drug candidates. A second issue for us, though, has been the diversity of molecules available for screening. Now, for three of these four areas that I mentioned, these are anti-infectives, and historically, it's been very difficult to find new molecules um, that really can go all the way in anti-infectives from the, the big pharma libraries, which don't tend to, to have the diversity of compounds that you really need for anti-infectives. So we've made a number of investments to, to try and increase the diversity of the compound libraries that we've been screening. One of these that we announced recently was of a company called uh, Anacor, which has a particular technology of making these oxaboral type compounds. And so most of the pharma, or none of the pharma company libraries contain compounds that have a boron atom in them, in this sort of position. And this is a, it's a technology that's proprietary to Anacor. But we've had a lot of success in this space in, in finding molecules that are active against the pathogens that we care about. And so we're now trying to drive these forward into to drug candidates. And there is actually a candidate in the clinic for sleeping sickness that came out of an, an Anacor library. Another area is structure-based design, which again is, is required across all of our disease areas. And in, in many cases, we have looked to try and look at very well-validated targets, targets which are chemically validated. In other words, we know that there is a chemical compound which can actually kill the pathogen through a particular target. We're trying to exploit that by getting structure-based uh, design underway, often in parallel with, with other di drug discovery efforts. And the final area is computational chemistry. It's another platform where it has broad applicability across num a number of different, uh, different areas. So we're looking at various different computational platforms that really help to boost the efforts that we're trying to make. Now, in, in this space, um, I've just highlighted here the, the pipeline from early target identification through to clinical development. I should also say that we work with a number of partners, these things called Product Development Partnerships, um, or PDPs, and there's four of them who are heavily involved in the drug discovery space, and, and these are the ones that we tend to work with here. And they tend to operate in the space between uh, where we actually have leads through lead optimization and, and taking things into the clinic, and developing a portfolio of projects across a single disease focus and being able to, to look, work with multiple partners and look across the area and focus their investments um, in, in the, the compounds that have the greatest chance of success. But directly from the foundation, we also work with a non, uh, many other organizations, with academia, with, with research institutes. We actually have a partnership here in Dundee um, uh, with the College of Life Sciences and a program that we jointly funded with the Wellcome Trust to do lead optimization. And then with many biotech companies and, and with many of the pharma companies as well. Now, these aren't hard and fast where these end points are. There's, they're all pretty gray and soft areas there. And there's in different diseases, we work in slightly different ways. So don't read into this that we don't have people working in lead optimization or that these guys don't do earlier work. It's not really like that. It's, it's a bit of a balance. But just in general terms, this is where the major focus of those different organizations is. So I'm going to walk you through how we're working in TB and the sorts of partnerships that we, we work with and why it's important to, um, not to, to try and look at these problems in isolation, but only look in collaborative programs. TB treatment today is, is still very difficult, and it's, it might be hard to believe, but it still takes a minimum of six months to treat a TB patient, and often up to, to two years. 
It requires multiple drugs, and this is just to give you a sense of this. This is about one-tenth of the course of a TB therapy. And so you start off with four drugs for a couple of months and then move on to two drugs for, for another four months. But you can imagine taking this lot is not that terribly easy. And you actually feel much better after a few weeks, so compliance is relatively poor with that therapy. There's also this issue of directly observed therapy, so you have to manage the patients very carefully, and the cost of the drugs only represents a small proportion of, cost of, of treating a patient. And then there's issues like drug safety. Um, you know, it's pretty astonishing that each of these drugs has pretty bad safety profiles. I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, overall they're pretty safe, but they're, they're much less safe than the drugs that you would probably take forward in, into the clinic today. Drug-drug interactions are a real issue. Rifampicin causes real problems in, in, uh, in, in, in also co-administering HIV medicines. And so we need to try and get to a regimen that's shorter, safer, and, and much easier to, to deliver. Now, there is some good news on the horizon, though. Um, the, uh, uh, last December, uh, the FDA approved uh, Bedaquilin. This is the first new TB drug that was approved in over 40 years. Now, it is only approved for multi-drug resistant TB, and it was, in, it was given accelerated approval on the basis of a phase two clinical trial. And the company is committed now to moving this forward into phase three trials. And, but that's, that's the one piece of really strong news, is, is that, that this drug has actually um, advanced uh, forward to, to registration. But as we look at partnerships across this continuum from uh, target identification through to clinical development, there's partnerships at each stage. I'm going to talk in detail about this TB drug accelerator program. There's the TB Alliance, which I mentioned, one of the product development partnerships. And there's another group called the Critical Path to TB Drug Regimen. But each of these work very closely, and the TB Alliance is really central to this as our major partner working in, in this space. And, uh, but none of them are, are in isolation. We work very closely at the discovery space to bridge the interaction between the Drug Accelerator Program and the TB Alliances Program. And the TB Alliance is a key partner in this, in this critical path. Now, if you look at the TB Alliances portfolio, the TB Alliance um, is, is a major player in this space. We fund the TB Alliance um, to a fairly significant level. It has a portfolio that looks very attractive, and, and you won't be able to read the details of this. And um, they work with very large numbers of, of partners. If you want to see this, it's, it's on their website. But I just want to make a few points. The first is that everything is being done as combination treatments, and um, they have a number of trials which are ongoing, um, both at phase three, and this, this one will actually read out later this year, this REMOX trial. So that's using um, a fluoroquinolone, a broad spectrum active fluoroquinolone, moxifloxacin, to replace um, one of the, the drugs in the current regimen. And there's two arms to that. There's one arm which is replacing isoniazid and another arm which is replacing uh, ethambutol. So those are very large phase three trials and, and looking to get a therapy that will be a four month therapy instead of a six month therapy. And then there's several trials in behind here which are looking at various combinations of, of newer agents. And you'll notice in here, bedacrolin is one of the components of this whole series. Of, of These are actually single arms of a different trial. There's a lot of activity going on at the early stage, but as you're probably aware, in, in any drug discovery effort, there's a lot of attrition happens. You need to feed an awful lot into this pipeline at this end to get a few candidates out. And the biggest issue for TB is that there's actually very little in this uh, intermediate space. There's nothing in phase one at the moment. And so we really need to try and boost that pipeline, and, and that's, that's been a big challenge for the, for the foundation. But let me talk about this uh, later clinical stage. So one of the partners, partnerships that I mentioned was the CPTR, or the Critical Path to a TB Drug Regimen. And again, you can find more detail on this uh, on the website. An idea here was to say, if you do trials the way we did the REMOX trial, you need to do these replacement studies, each of which takes about six years to do the phase three. So if you want a completely new regimen with four new drugs in it, it takes you 24 years. So what we're doing instead is to, to, to go forward with a novel combination testing uh, approach so that you can do each new drug simultaneously in combinations. That does require a very different approach to the regulatory um, environment. 
because there are some pretty big regulatory challenges here in terms of how do you make sure that all the components of the, the new therapy are actually contributing to the final outcome. And if there's a problem, if there's a serious adverse event, then which one of the four drugs was it that contributed to that? So these are serious issues. So we work very closely with the regulators, and the FDA has been incredibly supportive of, of this program. But it also involves a number of partners. There's a lot of pharma companies involved in this, and many other organizations around the world, to look at the regulatory environment, to look at some of the preclinical work that we need to do to select the best combinations, and then to work together to combine the different molecules to, to, to be sure that we can get to that final combination. But we've seen a lot of cooperation from the pharma companies in doing this, even in just in terms of designing phase two studies, so that if you're comparing two molecules, you've designed the studies in a close enough way that you can actually get some comparative data. And that wasn't happening previously, and there was no particular reason to go down individual routes. But now that the companies are working together, that's, that's going much better. But what really concerns us the most at the foundation is what does the next generation therapy look like? Instead of treating patients for six months or four months or if, you know, for the good wind behind us with the current agents, we might get down to three months, we started to ask the question, what would it take to get a therapy that works in one month or less? And the, the problem here is that, as is, is shown in this diagram, which is actually based on human data, um, here's the bacterial burden and this is the, the, um, the treatment and what you get over the first week is that you get this very rapid kill off of most of the bacteria that are in the lungs. But then a lot of bacteria reside for, a, uh, sorry, persist for a very long uh, uh, time. And it's very, very hard to kill these persisting organisms. So we started to think about how could we um, tackle this population and, and find new agents that are really able to, to shorten that therapy. So we need to look at many, many more candidates because we need many more things to combine, but also a greater diversity in the molecules that we're looking at and a much greater diversity of mechanisms um, uh, uh, to, to do this. So the solution to this was this um, TB drug accelerator program, which brings together a number of academic institutions, research institutes, including the National Institutes of Health, includes the Drug Discovery Unit here in Dundee, and then seven different pharmaceutical companies working very much in an integrated partnership where we're actually screening the compound libraries, we're doing hit and lead identification. And the way that we're actually screening is different from how the screening has been done in the past. We're screening under conditions under which TB might, um, the TB bacillus might grow inside the, the lungs of a patient. And under those conditions, it's actually pretty insensitive to today's drugs. So we're looking for things that kill under different conditions. But it's also very closely linked to target identification efforts so that we can use the whole suite of tools at our disposal instead of just um, trying to, to do optimization based on whole cell activity. The goal of this is to try and identify about five new clinical candidates by the end of 2016. And that, that should, combined with other things which are in the pipeline, hopefully yield a much shorter regimen um, with, within 10 years of the, the start of the program. But this is a very integrated program. It's not a case of each of these grantees working in isolation. And so the way that we've done this was to say that we had to have early collaboration really to avoid the redundancy that you normally see in these individual efforts. There's data sharing at every stage so that we maximize the efficiency of the program. And the companies can therefore work on each other's compounds. And this is a very different paradigm. So that only the best compounds are being advanced towards candidates. And we've really broken down a lot of the barriers here, and, and the data sharing that takes place, including the structures of the compounds, is at the hit stage. And although it's, it is still within the confines of a confidentiality agreement, there is a commitment, though, that we will put all the structures of the compounds into the public domain in a certain defined um, period of time. So that will, over time, lead to an awful lot more information being in the public domain. But this is really taking the, the program back to a sort of pre-competitive stage, if you like, and to try and really avoid this redundancy that happens. Because what we've found is that very often the same sort of chemotypes emerge from the compound libraries from the pharma companies. These all get worked on in isolation. And then, you know, for most things, they'll actually stop. Most programs go into hits to leads, a little bit of chemistry is done, then the program stops. That's just the attrition that happens in the pipelines. What we're finding is that when we get hits, we share those across the companies. 
And we've had multiple instances where we've said, ah, we've already, you know, another company's already made a few hundred compounds in that series and they found a particular issue with it. So we've actually stopped programs before they've started. The other thing that we've been able to do, and that avoids sort of futile approaches, the other thing we've been able to do is to say, somebody has a singleton compound from their compound library. What you would normally do with that is to say, it's a singleton, I don't know what to do with it. There's, you know, it's too much of a risk to put some chemistry onto it. So we asked the question, are there similar compounds within the other pharma company libraries? We've had a couple of instances where we've been able to identify over 600 compounds that are closely related in the other pharma libraries and been able to quickly screen those and, and then um, move things on much more rapidly. So just to, to uh, finish off, so this, this gives us a, a model for working in a very different way to, to address a, a disease like TB. So just to, to sum up, I hope I've given you an impression of, of the sort of work that the, the Gates Foundation does and, and um, the portfolio of programs that we have in our drug discovery projects. And then just finally an example of how we actually use partnerships and bring, try and bring people together to work much more efficiently in our space. If you want more information on the Gates Foundation, there's, there's lots of uh, electronic media to, to do that. And thank you very much for your attention.